Hello, Gary. Hello, Guy. So we just got here in time, didn't we? We have literally just rushed to Stuttgart from... You've forgotten already. God, where were we? <laughs> I forgot. Geneva. Geneva. We were in Geneva and we've made it by the skin of our teeth. We've both frantically set up in our different hotel rooms uh, yeah. because this is a fantastic, really, really exciting one. It is. And we don't need, she doesn't need much of an introduction, you know, Cheryl Crow. I mean, no. it, we, we don't need to tell our listeners how amazing she is and what she's done and all the success and the Grammys and the millions and millions of records. Um, but she has a fantastic film that's just come out, a documentary. Uh, called yeah. Cheryl, which we've both uh, been lucky enough to be able to watch. Yeah, and it's brilliant. I've got and I've got various personal connections with her, uh, certainly with her early days. Um, so that's very yeah. nice for me. So I don't yeah. think she'd probably go, who the hell are yeah. you? By the way, I just <laughs> wanted to tell you, I, I'm in the Who Room. Do you know what the, the Who Room is? No. 5.15. What's the Who? Oh. <laughs> Every time I get 5.15, I've had it a few times. I always think, <laughs> you know, I can't stop singing the tune in my head. No, well, of course, and I play it every night anyway, don't I? In you, uh, Arnold Lane. Uh, no, no, do you think Nick knows you play uh, a licks from 5.15 in Ar- Arnold Lane? I don't know. Um, I don't know. And well, uh, well, yes, he must do by now. I mean, it's on the album. <laughs> He's never frowned. Anyway. Oh, all right. I, He's I, never frowned. I, I digress. You do. We both digress. Okay, anyway, uh, let's get her on. Welcome to the Rock on Tears. Okay, guys, I'm ready. But it's a big tune for sure. I actually wrote that originally for Tina Turner. Of course, I had gone and found Joni Mitchell down in Florida and brought her back. I've listened to a few of them and they've been really good, man. I've been sitting in the back of the car coming into London. They're brilliant. Thank you guys for still being around, still making music, still being into it and doing this podcast. It, it's uh, it's fabulous. So great to talk to two guys that have done this. Remember me? I'm in a band now. <laughs> it's called Roxy Music. You know this thing about the 10,000 hours of experience? Oh, yeah, that's it. Get yeah. good at something. When we recorded Arnold Lane, we'd done about 50 hours. The Rock Hunters podcast with Gary Kemp and Guy Pratt. Oh! Hello. Oh, lovely to see you. How are you, Cheryl? Nice to see you all. You remember Guy. Guy's been worried you didn't remember him. Guy, I remember you. <laughs> oh, it's so nice to be remembered, Cheryl. It's been a very, very long time. <laughs> but we're still at it. We're still going. Isn't it amazing? You stronger than ever. Oh my God! Wow, I watched thank your you. Film. Amazing. And I've oh, you know, just I've been you. listening to um, threads. Oh my God! You know, fantastic. Yeah, your film thank really. You. Proudly, Cheryl. Your, proudly. your film was in. Inc- you grew up all. St- <laughs> You, we, we mentioned earlier to, to your PA that we're, we're just arrived in a, in a new in a hotel. We're in Stuttgart. We've travelled from Geneva. We're on tour together. Um, we play with nice. Nick, Mason, Nick Mason from Pink Floyd. Oh my gosh! Tell him I said hello. I absolutely. And will. so I, I love that you're so, yeah. still doing that, guy. I, I can't can't get away, Cheryl. Can't get away yeah. from this kind of the family. Because I should just for our listeners point out that Cheryl and I met on the um, when the Michael Jackson and Pink Floyd tours were crisscrossing with each other in okay. 88. And Greg and Cheryl became our sort of mascots. You, you two were hanging out together. You used to come and hang with us. Greg Fillingate. Yes. Right? And then there was this lovely thing because Greg Fillingate, Greg then ended up coming on tour with David Gilmore. Um, oh, I didn't realise that. Yeah, which was lovely. And in fact, I sent him a message. I said I was going to be speaking to you because I, I was really moved to see him in your docker. And I said, yeah. I said, hey, have you, have you got anything you'd like to say? And he just, uh, I'm so grateful for the times I shared with Cheryl and Guy and that we're still in each other's lives to this day. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I speak right, with Greg go. frequently, probably more now than in, in years. And uh, I'll tell you what, it's funny. I don't know about you, Guy, but as I get older... My relationships become so much more precious and I don't know, I guess it's you have a stronger sense of time and how short, how fast it's going and how short life is and just staying connected, how, how important it is. Yeah. My wife said to me the other day, don't, don't make any new friends because we don't have time to see the ones we already (laughs) have. (laughs) But uh, that's true. That's but true. We, it's true. She, when she sees you talking to someone at a party, she pulls you away. Yeah, we, um, that's right. That's right. You listen, cannot make more friends. Sure. I want to tell you this because we both, uh, Guy and I, both uh, watched the film, finished the film this morning. 
And we came down to breakfast where we were and we both said exactly the same thing. Oh, my God, the bit with the children, I cried. And, and Yeah, we both cried. And, and I, I felt it. I mean, I just welled up so strongly because I've been away now for seven weeks with Guy and Nick. And we've got two more weeks left. And I've got a 10-year-old. I've got a 13-year-old. I've got older kids. I miss them so much. It's the hardest thing about uh. being on tour. It is. I mean, I'm very lucky. You know, I've I've been able to take my kids on the road from the very beginning. I mean, my uh, Wyatt, who's 15 now, has been on a tour bus since he was, you know, six months old. And Levi, because I didn't know Levi was coming, two weeks later, he was in a crib on a bus. He's being passed around in this communal environment. And, um, and I've not ever shared my kids on social media. I've always been sort of abjectly opposed to that mm -hmm. so to be able to put them in in the documentary because they are the most important part of my story to put them in there i mean it felt really impactful and i cannot i've watched the documentary twice i watched it when they first did it put it together and then i went to the premiere and i just i you know yeah i boohoo i'm mm -hmm. i'm Mm. I'm just, it's very yeah. sentimental for me. And, I, and I've had that reaction from a lot of people. It's really struck a lot of people, so. Well, especially as you're, you're already utilizing at least one as a tech to bring you your <laughs> Both of them. <laughs> we were out with Phil Collins, right? A couple of years ago, before the pandemic, we went out with Phil Collins. And, you know, he's huge. And we're playing these giant soccer stadiums, like 80,000 people. And I told the boys, since they're older now, if you guys help tech and you bring out guitars, you help tune and stuff, I'll pay you per show, five dollars a show. That's pretty good. Five dollars a show. Brilliant. So Is we are. I don't stadium, know where stadium we were. Gig? <laughs> no, I, you know, you got to get help where you can. <laughs> but um, we're we're taking a bow at the end of the at the end of a show somewhere, and my kids come out, and as we're walking off, my then ten year old says, "Mom." Can we negotiate a flat fee, get our money up front, as opposed to having to wait to the end of the summer? I'm oh, just, what are you, an accountant? But it's great. Crazy. It's great <laughs> you take. They're very savvy. That little bit of home that comes with you is so important uh, because the, the, the guitar player. We had a dog. You took a dog yeah, on. That's yes, what I was going to oh, say. Because yes. the guitarist oh. in the band. Who, oh, sorry, Gary. Doesn't have children. Yeah. He's in love with his dog and misses his dog so much. Eric, who's named after Eric Clapton, by the way. And he, oh my God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. He uh, he he welled up at the bit with the dog because he <laughs> that you took your dog on the road. <laughs> We feel that way about our dogs. I mean, we've really, um, we have really been tossing around the idea of bringing our dogs on the bus, but you know, yeah. can't do or, it. Well, or you could go the whole hog and do the tour on horseback. Just, Ooh, <laughs> just take the horses nice. as well. <laughs> nice. Really, just for the environmental look would be great. Well, Not that, use yeah. any gas, just have the whole thing horse Cheryl. and buggies and carts and you know it's it's uh <laughs> Cheryl, it's tricky doing the, the choosing the moment to say now i'm going to do the documentary about my past when you're an artist that is always pushing forward and and, and making new art what made you think now is the time and, and and was it the director that convinced you to go with her um, well, there are a couple of things. I, I really didn't want to do a documentary, but um, my manager, who's obviously in the documentary, has been with me from the beginning, was really encouraging of it. He said, look, we've been, we've had a lot of people reach out. Obviously, documentaries are very popular right now. And that was one of the reasons I didn't want to do it. But he said, you know, you, you have a lot of interest and the fact that you've been around for so many years. I mean, that the, the fact that you know, I had a whole life before I ever got my record deal. My first album didn't come out till I was 29. Yeah. Um, it, it, uh, it seemed like a good time to do it. Plus we were all in a pandemic, so there wasn't anything else going on, but I don't think I really understood how emotional it was going to be to sit for hours on end and not just remember, but reflect like to revisit some of these hard stories um, and, and, you know, it's not like you just tell the stories, you know, you really put yourself back in it. So it, it was, I mean, in the end, it's been really good because I'm a very private person and I've not ever told the whole story. Um, and a lot of it is still on the cutting room floor. 
but to be able to just do it in, in my own terms and tell the stories and then be done with it um, and have people, um, you know, I mean, they're, it's all there. It's all out there. But it's an amazing, must have been an amazing thing for you to, because then you can actually see the path of your life. Because actually Joe Walsh, who features in it quite heavily, fabulously. Yeah. There was, I remember seeing him interviewed in something once. He made this brilliant point. He said that someone had once said that a life, as you live it, seems like this completely mad, random set of events that you stagger from one thing to the other. So but then you get to the end of it and look back, not seeing at the end of it, but when you get to a point of it and look back, it looks like the most perfectly crafted novel. Yeah, you know, I, you know, I, it's like I, everything I was saying, you know, you'll, you'll, people will say, do you have any regrets? And I, I look at it and go, oh, no. I mean, I feel like everything brought about the next thing and the next thing. And I learned from doing the wrong thing here. And that's why the right thing happened mm -hmm. here. And yeah, I mean, it is so true. I just don't know if there's ever a point in your life when you actually sit down and force yourself to remember everything. I mean, so much of it, and I, you know, obviously I'm older now, um, you forget so much of it, you know, and there's never a reason to actually sit down and remember things. And this was really an exercise in digging, you know, digging around in the, mm -hmm. in the caverns of, of my memory banks. And, and I mean, I would be on the couch at eight o'clock at night, sound asleep, just exhausted mm -hmm. Um, because it's hard. It's really hard work to actually sit and think and remember. I think what comes across in, yeah. the, in, the, in the documentary for me, and I watch a lot of rock documentaries, we, we all do, um, but the bits that are, we all connect to, not just as, uh, me as a, someone who's in the same business as you, but people who are out in all other kinds of jobs, are the bits when life gets really tough and your story has some really tough moments in it that you mm -hmm. have to face that are universal and how you approach those and how you push through those is a, is a lesson for us. And that's why we're watching the documentary. And that's what I got from the documentary. I mean, I, I do love hearing you say that. I do feel like, you know, even though my life has revolved around music, particularly as a woman, um, there are themes in it that apply to everybody. I mean, I, I know g genetically that my mental health. Um, I come by it honestly, um, and a lot of us do. Um, but I also know that the pressure of life can throw you into really challenging moments where you can't find your way out. And particularly now with what we're going through, uh, not just God, yeah. the pandemic, but just everything. I mean, everything is harder now. And we there's no handbook. There's no like, okay, this is what you do when you can't find your way out read this chapter and there there is none of that you just have to figure out um you know you have to feel your way through it and um and and as a woman and having a, being in a business that's run by men from for the most part um which is true in corporations it's not just in the entertainment world to navigate the sexual um you know uh, challenges i mean I, it's not all sexual harassment but we're, we're at a moment now where at least we're being taken seriously when we have these stories but you know 30 years ago there was none of that i mean you were vilified and yeah. and then you know for me now being in a business that's revolved around being looking perfect you know having the big lips as opposed to the wrinkled lips you know it's you you enter as a woman you enter an ageist uh moment you know and, and all of these things are the reality of life and of living no matter what your line of work is it's it's amplified when you're in a line of work where you're where you're in the public eye obviously but but it's 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 navigating how to handle knowing yourself well enough to know what you will do and what you won't do and then having to be okay with that yeah mm. I also like, especially especially with, in the light of what's just happened in America, which is just shocking. It's shocking. Sort of like, look, yeah, looking back, like at how politically powerful, say, the Lilith Fair was. Yes, yes. That you know, that's. Yeah. I mean, were you aware of that at the time? Was you know because it's look at look at it now. It's like it's pretty, just explain just yeah. explain what the Lilith Fair was. Uh, was well, it was, I mean, it was, it was female a, performers. It, it was an act of defiance. I mean, honestly. Right. Um, I remember the day that Sarah McLaughlin called me and, you know, there weren't cell phones or texting and she actually called me up. 
and said, I'm very tired of hearing promoters say we can't <clears throat> have more than one woman on a bill. Yeah. Um, I can remember um, there was an artist, a female artist I wanted to bring out with me. And I mean, I was cut off at the knees by a promoter saying, an agent saying, you won't sell tickets. People don't want to come see, um, you know, men won't buy tickets to a bill that only has women on it. And yeah. I, that just absolutely was uh, dumbfounding. And so when Sarah had this idea, she's like, will you share the bill? Will you do the whole tour? And I, I was absolutely unequivocally on board. And then from that moment on, it felt like an act of defiance. Um, it felt like a call, you know, a call to action. And then it felt like a total celebration, um, sort of a grand fuck you, if you will. Um, and I, I think no one had any idea what the, what the tentacles of that would look like. I mean, you, you talk to young artists like Brandy Carlisle who say I was in the audience. Yeah. yeah. Um, that was the moment where I, I, I was like, okay, I'm, a young gay woman um, and, but I can do this and I can sell tickets to uh, other gay people, but families also uh, men. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's music is not relegated mm -hmm. to just one demographic. It but, is a heart thing. You know? That's interesting. You say that because you know, when a, when a, when a, when a male singer songwriter uh, releases an album, he's apparently speaking to, to young people everywhere. When a female artist releases, a singer songwriter releases, she's speaking to young girls everywhere. It's like, why? What? What? Hang I on. Know. You, I... Your your music, yeah. your lyrics. I mean, I re I remember, you know, when uh, um, when one of your tracks came out. I'm driving up onto um, Sun. I'm driving up to Santa Monica Boulevard, and K Rock was playing, and I hear that lyric straight coming out all of the all radio. I do, all I want to do, like coming that. out of the radio. Yeah. I'm like, wow this song's about me right now. You know, I, I didn't know who you were at the time. It was just, it was, it was, you were a new artist, but, but do you see what I'm saying about, about that sort of implication? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, 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 um, I did an interview earlier today with a guy who's, I mean, he's probably in his forties or fifties. And he's like, I was 19 when the globe sessions came out. And I felt like that whole album was written for me. And that's, I mean, as an artist, that's like the highest compliment, because for me, when I was a kid, I felt like every song that Elton and that James Taylor and Carole King, I mean, those were the singer songwriters that gave me that tunnel out of my hometown and also out of myself and out of my reality. And um, that's the whole thing. And I, I think, you know, people with the business mind that wear the business hats that try to market they can only see it one way. And it, that's not the reality of music. Music is about the intervals and about the, uh, it, about the, the, the words and the melodic choices and it's bigger, you know? And I think that Lilith was that moment that sort of illustrated that. Yeah, I find it shocking that that was even a thing. And I feel guilty as a man that that had never occurred to me. I never knew there was a thing about yeah. you know, not having women, all women built. It's yeah, but that's the same as also, in the... So can I say, I mean, I hate to say this, that the, the thing we come up against, Cheryl, is, is that we invite, we are perceived as being a very, very male podcast. And Gary and I are really not toxic masculinity sort of people at all. And it's, we find it very hard to get women to come on our show. Maybe because there's two guys. Really? And nice and friendly. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's two guys. And, I, and, I, it's, and it's understandable. That, and it's, it's, Upsetting. You know, oh, so, I hate so that. That's it. crazy. Okay, it's, that is just crazy. Okay, that, that, that ends right now. Well, I tell you. That ends right now. Yeah. Um, talking about we need, a li we need our Lilith. <laughs> no, stop yes. it. You are, in fact, yes. you are our Lilith. No. <laughs> I, I am the man. Uh, I am the man to your Lilith. Um, yeah, exactly. Cheryl, talking about people being in the audience who, whose lives got changed, uh, I, I was talking to my wife earlier. Uh, and I was telling her about your documentary, and uh, and she went, "Was she that? Was she that girl on stage with Michael Jackson? I saw that show in uh, when it came to London, and she changed yeah. everything for me. I wanted to be her. In fact, she was me on stage with Michael, and she had no idea it was Cheryl Crow. Oh All these my years. goodness! That yeah. 
That is that yeah. is crazy. Do you know what I remember from that show? I remember being introduced to Peter Gabriel, which I mean, I was still a total nobody, small town Missouri, and I'm I get introduced to him, and I'm holding a Diet Coke, and as he's shaking my hand. I'm shaking both of my hands up and down, and Diet Coke is going everywhere. <laughs> That's how I remember. Um, and I also met Eric Clapton those shows. Those shows we did several nights at Wembley, and um, mm-hmm. yeah. and Greg Fillingaines introduced me to Eric Clapton at one of those shows. So yeah, you know. How, how was it working with Michael Jackson? All kinds of full circle. How was it working with Michael? Oh, it was, it was incredible. I mean, for, for a number of reasons, it was incredible. For one thing, he, you know, I grew up on his music. I owned all the Jackson five. My first album that I got from Santa Claus was ABC. Um, and then, uh, you know, I'd never even been out of my own country. I was, I had to get a passport to actually go on that tour and to see the world that way was incredible, but not just that, but to be in a, what was, you know, ostensibly was a traveling circus. It was just like all these people from every walk of life traveling together and seeing the world um, backing up arguably the the most famous artist of our time um, Mm. was incredible and life-changing. But then you also have the other kind of oddity spectacle of it. You know, um, he wasn't just any artist. And um, by the time I came off of that tour, I had been connected with him romantically, which was clearly probably the device of, of his promotion team um, right. but my life was changed personally from that as well yeah it comes out in them too you know the i have a funny memory cheryl i have a funny memory I've, i don't remember where it was because we bumped into you it was in paris and in dallas and various places but i remember you and Greg we were at, coming we were at uh bandouche together guy i don't know if you yes, remember that the van- that's, in paris yes. i do remember that yes yeah I've got some very nice pictures of you, actually, in a little brasserie um, in Paris. Oh, uh, that's amazing. And, sorry, Guy, you keep yeah. photographs we, of but... Cheryl in a brasserie. What brasserie do you keep them in? <laughs> <laughs> so strange. Bra- well, wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't you? No, it's... Brasserie. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember being, we were in a hotel room somewhere, and it was, no, I mean, lots of us. There were, it was a kind of party. I think it might have been Gary Wallace's room. And you and... Greg and I were sitting up against the wall. And, and Scooter. David called down. Scooter was there also. Oh, yeah, Scooter was there. Yeah. yeah. But, and David, and David Gilmore. Gilmore called down to see where the party was. And it was like, well, Gary, Gary said, oh, it's in my room. So David came to hang out in the room. And I remember you and Greg just looking like absolute stuff. Because this was the equivalent of Michael coming to one of your rooms. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, and you know what else is funny? And I don't know if you remember this, but... We'd been in there for a good 30, 45 minutes. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a uh, cupboard or a, a, a closet door opens and Nick Mason just falls out. <laughs> what? <laughs> Do you remember that? He's been in there. Oh, don't. And then and the door swings open and he just falls straight out. Oh, that's bad. That's I mean, we, that we sounds more like something I moment. would do. Uh, that's, that's I will absolutely ask him about that uh, moment. That, something, that's fine. Something, that's something that comes over in the, in, the, in the documentary about the Jackson tour, obviously, is your sort of first experience of the darker side of being a woman uh, in, in this male world, which is yeah. uh, you, you, you end up in with, the, with you know, in, with that with sexual harassment from from Michael's manager. I mean, did, was there a sense of like, I can't carry on in this business? How am I? You know, did, you never wanted to get out at that point? Yeah, I, um, you know, I think the whole thing culminated on Thanksgiving Day in Australia. Um, I mean, I remember exactly where I was. I remember, you know, in America, we eat turkey. We were eating emu, if you can imagine. Um, we're all sitting around in this giant hall. They have turkeys in Australia. I know, I know. I think that was one of the things that was offered, but I, I don't know why. You know, it's weird what sticks out in your memory banks. But um, yeah, yeah. But I remember um, being in this big hall and Frank coming over and pointing at me and said, remember this moment, you'll never have it again. And, wow, you know, it was such a cliche um, and no one on the tour knew what had been going on. Um, and I, after he left, I remember being in a side room with a couple of the backup singers and explaining to them what I'd been through. And um that was the day that it had come out all over the tabloids that Michael Jackson's manager 
had been fired for supposedly managing uh, the backup singer. And I, I hadn't gone public. No one had that I knew of. Um, and he had signed, a, signed a, an exclusivity contract with Michael. So it was a very dark time and it made me lose faith in uh, the whole thing. I didn't realize there was so much, there were so many machinations that went into somebody being huge at radio, you know, that there was payola, that, that there was a mob like, in some instances, um, you know, a, a, a mob like yeah. history of uh, getting corporations to buy singles and driving the songs up the charts. I mean, it was just, it was very unsavory. And when I went home, I did feel like, okay, he's going to make it impossible for me ever to work again, especially after having gone to an attorney and gotten and, and getting no help. Can we talk about the the, uh, the your the little group of musicians that I know Guy knows that end that you ended up on this Tuesday night club uh, playing yes. with because uh, some of those you're, you 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 had some connection. You did you not sing on Cheryl's first album, Guy? I did. I'm I'm uncredited on the Na Na song, the Sha Na Na song. Are you serious? Yeah, I came to a couple of the Tuesday nights because of course you know remember because I. For those who don't know, the Tuesday Night Music Club kind of grew out of Toy Matinee, right? The band which I was in. Right. Was I did the um. Right. But, um, of yes, so I came to I came to a couple of those Tuesday nights, and I remember the funny. If I listen to the album, I can hear myself. Oh my gosh, I, I, guy, I doing cannot it. believe. Don't worry, I'm not hassling you for a credit. Don't worry. <laughs> that is great. Well, you are credited then. You are credited. Yeah. Um, oh no, I'm not trying to I, don't, I, don't I don't know that I remember that, but okay. I will say in my defense. Oh, no, I spoke to Brian. I spoke to Brian. McC There's no defense involved. I spoke to Brian <laughs> yeah. McLeod the other, uh, the, and he and he was saying, "Oh God, yeah, I remember that night." Yes, I mean those nights were very debauched, as I recall. They were very debauched. There was a lot of tequila. Do you want to take us through that? Explain it. Where it was, Cheryl, and what the vibe was like. Okay, so. Um, Okay, it was in Pasadena. And so let me explain to you how this whole thing came about. So I made a record, um, a very expensive record with the yeah, with wonderful, someone we've had on. incredible yeah. Hugh Padgham. And, um, but, I, but I went into the record level and said, I feel like this isn't, I mean, it's very beautiful and slick. And I don't feel like that that's, it's, it's not going to serve me very well because I'm sort of raw around the edges. And anyway, cut to, I wind up, playing keyboards in toy matinee, the touring version. Because Pat Leonard and Kevin Gilbert, who are the two, but they had sort of fallen out at this point, right? I, yeah, they, I had no they idea fallen what was out going on. And, <laughs> and Pat Leonard didn't want, to, didn't want to tour, he wanted to stay home and produce. And um, mm -hmm. so anyway, a band was put together and I was the keyboard player in it. And I wound up being very good friends, in fact, dating Kevin Gilbert, uh, who introduced me to Bill Bottrell. Um, and uh, he and Bill decided, let's, let's put together a jam session. They had one. They invited me to the second one. It was called the Tuesday Night Music Club. And it was David Berwald and David Schwartz of David and David. Mm, it was Kevin David, Gilbert, David. Boy Matinee. It was Brian McLeod, who is still my favorite drummer of all time. I mean, crazy. Yeah. The first guy, the first guy to go back to being Ringo in the 80s. He was the first yes. guy I thought to yeah, get yeah, to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He definitely was. His feel yeah. was impeccable and his choices were very Ringo. Yeah. Um, all that to say, he was in a band called Wire Train, um, uh, had played, uh, obviously, uh, on Toy Matinee. And so it was us group of guys and Bill Bottrell. I don't think I'm leaving anybody out. Okay, no, yeah. No, that's all, that's um, the so I got invited to the first, the first one. I was the only girl there. Um, and then I got invited to the second one. The first one, I think, rendered Leaving Las Vegas, maybe, or um, I'm not exactly sure. Anyway, and then after sort of a few of those those jam sessions, which revolved around hanging out really late at night, going out to the Olive, talking conspiracy oh, theories, yeah, drinking a ton, you know, drinking a ton and jamming. Um, very, you know, very literati, very all of us misfits, all of us misunderstood. We're so talented. How can we not be famous? But we wouldn't want to be famous, <laughs> talented. Um, then after that, then Bill decided I'm going to produce this girl. And then he sort of man started managing, uh, the, the sessions, but it all started and culminated from these, these crazy, very debauched 
jam sessions. Do you mind? So I don't know if you mind me saying, but like, don't worry. It's I have no idea where the cassette is in the box. But during this period, you actually sang a demo for me of a song I wrote with Kevin for a Japanese girl group called Make Some Time For Me. Oh and God. on it, have... you did all the little, you did all the little Michael Jackson noises because you were doing those for Michael on stage, weren't you? You actually yes, did all the. I was. <laughs> uh, yes, I was. I was doing a lot of deviling and. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I don't remember that. Fantastic. I'm shocked. I can't believe we didn't put that in the documentary. <laughs> I, I, I'm really not shocked it didn't go in the documentary. I can't even find the cassette. It was a very funny thing. It was me and Kevin trying to be scritty politi. What what I like what what I love, oh Cheryl. What I love about that first album and what I love about the what, what you, who you were, was um you know, a lot of backing singers, people who have done you know singing for other people on stage. You know that twenty feet from stardom or whatever it is, they have a particular voice, and it tends to be full blooded, and we've heard it a lot. But what. Th- the person you you were you were on that album and have, and have been since w- was speaking to us through your voice. It's it wasn't it didn't have a formality about it. It had a it was character driven. It was it was you know that it was had no reverb on it. It didn't have any of those effects, those posh effects that you need. Does that is that something you 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 were conscious of happening at the time with Bill? Well, Bill was very conscious of that. I mean, and also Bill had a very distinct, which guy I know, you know, a very distinct uh, producing, but also engineering style. You know, he got a ton from working with Jeff Lynn and, um, and yeah. he was the one I think that really created the, uh, the sonic environment. And so much of it was about um, the character and with we, Bill, it's almost like what things sound like is almost political. You know, yeah, it's oh, yes. like your snare sound is a political statement. How much your reverb is a political statement, you know? Oh, my goodness. Absolutely. And, and not only that, he had a rule that if you could play something really well, you weren't allowed to play that. That's you know, right. Would, on the would... Tuesday night, the, the night I was on the Tuesday night music club, I was playing pedal steel guitar. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes. I have no idea how to play a pedal steel guitar. Yes. I mean, he always made, he, in fact, I can remember. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I won't go into that. But anyway. Um, Let's talk about your I, voice. You know, I learned so, I learned so much from him and, and, and I learned things that I have taken with me uh, along the way. I mean, I, that I incorporate into recording my own records. You know, I'm, I'm constantly saying, okay, I love what you just played now set that down and go, go over to the piano, you know, that kind of thing. And, um, and also just, just his love of gear and sonics and doing exactly opposite of what your instinct is. Um, they used to have this phrase that if it had been done before that you are heading towards the vortex of mediocrity. Yeah. Do you remember them saying that? That's, if it's yeah, been that's, done, that's, it's mediocre, you know, been, and that's yeah. That's such that, a real thing to say. It's, yes, it is. It is. And even on the, you know, many years later, we worked together on another record called Detour. It's just, yeah, it was I mean, just I, lovely that I, that happened. We learned from him. Just, he was so eccentric, but such an artist. You know, one thing, another thing, obviously, that, that we see in the documentary. Yeah. And is, is the, hang on. Sorry. One thing that's really sad in the documentary is how this is a moment when every, all of you should be celebrating, you know, winning Grammys and, and having the success of this record, especially you. But one stupid moment on David Letterman seems to change everything. And when I watched that, I felt total sympathy with you because you just make it, you know, if I'd be the same, this is where an artist promoting and David Letterman said, is leaving Las Vegas autobiographical? And you say, yeah, kind of. Well, that's the best way it should be said because that sells the records to people. And they and people got upset about that in the band and it caused all kinds of terrible, terrible repercussions that, that, that obviously have no place in reality. And in the oh, documentary and seems to obviously really still affect you, you know? Yeah, I mean, it, uh, uh, it does still affect me. And, and I think mainly because yeah. it was the, my first foray into um, the betrayal of friendship. You know, I, these guys were... Mm. 
my beloved friends and Bill and I were super conscious about making sure whoever was in the room got an equal slice. And, um, and, and, you know, everybody in that room was an artist and at which point I needed to go out and promote it. Nobody wanted to be in a band in a van because they'd all, they'd all tour, they'd all had big careers, but at which point I did make it, it was like, well, we want to, we want to be the band. And I was like, I can't, I can't find my band. I mean, we, it, it, you know, and then the David Letterman thing happened and then John O'Brien and, and yeah, I, I think it was just John, John O'Brien. I can't see it how was you a can really, I mean, awful situation. Well, I mean, all that to say is that you, you know, they're going to be, they're going to be, no matter what you go through, they're going to be moments that are pro- so profoundly disappointing that you pick up your, you pick yourself up and dust yourself off and move forward or you don't. And those are the, those are the moments that sort of where the rubber meets the road. You either keep going or you don't. And it probably is a weed out in my business, um, how much stamina you have and how much belief you have in yourself as well, that you, that you put yourself back out there again and again. Well, talking about self-belief, because what's extra is what you go and do, because that weird thing that I still can't quite figure out about how Bill comes to New Orleans and then just goes. And then, but, but the fact that you did that next album all on your own. Yeah. Complete. I mean, no, that's fa- amazing. You produced, you know, with that fantastic yeah, and engineer. And it's a play. That's extraordinary. Well, in Bill's defense, you know, I, I, I don't know what was going on in his personal life. And Bill, like I said, is he's an artist like everybody else. And you don't know when someone's going through something, how they're going to handle it. We'd had a great evening, gone out and drunk a bunch. And the next thing he was gone. So and I, and I look at every event and go, OK, if Bill had stayed, I would not have made that record. And yeah, yeah. if Bill had stayed, there would still be goo around the second record. And it was it was a moment where, OK, you're starting over and here is this incredible and quirky and brilliant female engineer that you're going to work with mm-hmm. um, and you're going to pull in two friends. I mean, Brian McLeod, I, I just Brian, you know, I cool. can't speak highly enough about him. Um, I, I could use the bass player because I wound up, me and Jeff wound up like doing the. Uh, You're a pretty game. mean bass player yourself. It must be well, sad. O- only, um, I mean, I, ha- I have my moments, but only because, you know, that it was a, hey, close the door, get in there in the basement kids and make music and have fun and then decide later on what you're going to do with it. And that was really the attitude. But that's Jeff Trott you're talking what, about, what, right? If we look at. You're talking, yeah. you're talking Jeff about Trott, yeah. Jeff Trott, who's, who's been a real yeah. key player in your career, hasn't he? Oh, he's yeah. my musical husband. He's my other, you know, he's my Keith. Yeah. But even, sorry, Cheryl, just say, look at, at the point we've got to in your story. It's quite extraordinary. There's been, you've been, ju- there's the Michael Jackson thing, this huge thing, which has ended really horribly. That could have ended a lot of people. You've then gone and been given that amazing thing of, of you know, of a massive posh Q pattern produced record which you've said no to you've then started this the whole thing the Tuesday Night Music Club which you finally get your success and then everything falls apart and then you're left alone to make an album I mean this is make you're battling odds all the way and you know and that being said it, only a documentary would make me actually go back and live everything sequentially and try to understand it. And uh, it's it's a weird thing doing a documentary. It um, and it is it is liberating telling the story yeah. in my own terms. But I didn't expect that it was going to be. I mean, I still get really emotional even talking about it, which I'll try to spare you guys. <laughs> but yeah, there was no, a lot. It's a very emotional. It's an emotional ride because one you know one finds obviously you know I'm a huge fan and I have very fond memories of you, but. You're, it's very, you're a very easy person to get invested in. I think that's a lot of your, you know, because there's a, a truth and a sort of realness about you. So I think people will find the documentary emotional. But also, right? I, I think, I think and, and something else you're battling against, Cheryl, or battled against, certainly then, was that when a guy goes out and just, you know, makes records and thinks only of his career, that's fine. He's a, he's a successful guy. When a woman does it, they're driven. And that is... There's something critical yes. about that word, mm-hmm. isn't there? That the implication is that she's a bit of a hard <laughs> bitch and oh, she's yeah. going to, you know, no matter. And that's, yeah. a sec- that's, again, it's another part of the sexist uh, uh, business that you're having to 
fight. Oh, absolutely. You know, um, uh, it's it's that ambition thing. When a man is ambitious, it's very, um, I mean, that's that's a good trait. When a woman is ambitious, she's a bitch, mm-hmm. you know? And I mean, that's one of the reasons that in America, we don't have a female president. It's like, we have this problem, you know, with, well, she's too ambitious. She's not likable. Well, we're, we're inching forward, but good grief. It's like enough already. And, and that has been something that, um, that I certainly have suffered throughout all of my career. I mean, like being called a perfectionist is like such a dig um, when really it's, it's something to sort of aspire to. You want things to be the best they can be while still maintaining authenticity and, you know, yeah. but yeah, yeah. It, it, there's, it, it's, it's a, it's a weird business. There's a there's a moment in the film when when we, when we see you struggling with not knowing what you should be writing your lyrics about. Your lyrics are so brilliant, and but they tell stories about you and about experience. And then you 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 come up against a situation which a lot of artists it happens to a lot of artists when all of your experience is simply the music business, and that that yes. was that was a tough time for you, wasn't it? It was. I mean, I think everything culminated around the fact that I was getting ready to turn 40 and everything on the radio was like Britney Spears, like these 17 year olds. And I'm trying, I'm also competing with the fact that I've had all these hits and, and who am I now? And what am I going to write about? I've only been on the road for the last 15 or 12 years. Um, And also putting that pressure on myself that, okay, I can't take time off until I get this record done. And yet what I really needed was time off to live. So I'd have something to write about. And it's, it happens to every artist. I mean, that's when yeah. that's when those records get made that people go, oh, they're they're rich and famous now. And they have nothing to say. And, you know, a million and a half dollars goes into making a record that you're just like, I cannot figure out how to finish this thing. Um, and, you know, ultimately, some really good things came out of that record. You know, Soak Up the Sun, obviously. And um, I mean, there were some big hits on it, but but it was a record that was sorely crafted. And I mean that in a derogatory sense and that, yeah, you do learn how to craft songs along the way. You learn how to write a good song, but are those songs, the songs that you feel define who you are. And, and, you know, the one thing that came out of that period was, I think I wound up being, you know, having to get help uh, for some, uh, you know, real depression. I wound up, I wound up going into Mount Sinai and what I came out of it with, with was the weather channel, which was sort of the ender of that oh, record, yeah, it was which, fantastic. Yeah. which I think is, you know, that, that record has, has good moments on it, but to me, the mo the most authentic and maybe only authentic moment on that record was a song I didn't remember writing at all. Right. Wow. That's interesting. Cause you do have the one, you have this great ability. You write that universal hook, right? You write that thing that goes out, speaks. It. It's a wonderful catchy thing and speaks to everyone. And is like, is, is that part of your crafting or is that like a stop? Or do you have, do those things fall out for you? Do you know what I mean? Sometimes when things just fall out of the guitar or do you think there it is? Well, I have my ways of writing, which are come natural mm. to me. I'm, I'm, I'm always, I think because I grew up on the Beatles, I grew up on the Rolling Stones. I mean, mm. they were masterful at tricking you into thinking um, that that song was easy to write. You know, yeah. they mm. they were they could write something that felt like it was simple, and yet it, you could never write it in a million years. You know, like a song mm. like "Let It Be" or "Yesterday" or. Um, can't get no satisfaction or, I mean, epic. Um, yeah. and, and I think I just always have gravitated to the hook and then written the song around it. Um, so, you know, there, there have been those songs along the way though. And I think every artist will attest to that you write, that you go, I have no idea where that came from. That's not even a style I write. And those are the one, ones that make you want to keep going. You know, the ones where yeah. you got out of your ego, egoic headspace and something jumps <laughs> through, you know. But I've not been able to get if it makes you happy out of my head all day since listening to it this morning, you know, when yeah. that big euphoric okay, and I, I'm going to say, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb um, uh, and, and just tell the truth about that song, which I have before. But Jeff Trott walked in 
with that epic line. I would love to totally take credit for that, but it's it's a it's a, one of those brilliant moments when he walked in with a line, the melody and everything, and I said, "Oh my God, that is completely." perfect for illustrating where I'm at right this right now in this moment in time um you know just synchronous so and I, universal I, there's everyone has and universal that, every, yeah but it has that classic yeah. country country twist doesn't it if it makes you happy you know you know why are you so sad or whatever it has that kind of country thing it's, of it's very the, the opposite. Yes. I don't know how many times I've seen them play and when he goes up to do his his sets, uh, you know, his songs in the set, he'll always say something on the mic like, I'm happy to be here. And then he'll finish it with, I'm yeah. happy to be anywhere. You know, yeah, it's like anywhere, one of those yeah. lines that's yeah. like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so cheeky, but yeah, it's kind of true. Your duet with him. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah I, I, I worship I worship that man. What a yeah, great weekend. We've great right. weekend. We've just had for septuagenarians and octogenarians. I mean, we played on stage with Nick at a big open air concert. Uh, the Rolling Stones played in Hyde Park. And the Paul, same night. Paul played at Glastonbury. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it gives me hope. I mean, I don't know, with the exception of Stevie Nicks, you know, uh, I don't know many women that are still doing it and that people are coming to see. And um, I, it gives me great hope. And I, I saw the Rolling Stones here with Steve Jordan, who um, I felt like really honored Charlie, um, honored the legacy of the Rolling Stones. Um, but they were they were incredible. I mean, why why should they not be? And 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 Sir Paul, who I know just played Glastonbury at eighty, did thirty eight songs. You, you I mean, that makes me want to go take a nap right now. Well, so, well, we have to listen. Well, I've got Nick Mason playing. We got him playing Astronomy Domini every night, like a you know, like a wild dervish. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. You know, I, I, it is what keeps us young. It's Absolutely. what keeps us going. You, know? you, know, you spoke earlier about about um, you know p making records that are, that surprise you and aren't necessarily in, feel like they're in your genre. Um, and and I wondered what you thought about that because <laughs> you know you, you, you've won awards for pop act, for rock act, for country act, and some of those things are, are quite you know entrenched in their tribes, aren't they? You know. You, Countries over here, yeah. and and and, and, yeah. and that sort of amorphic Cheryl Crow is that something that you like to be? I don't really think about it. I mean, you know, for me, one of the things that I loved about the Rolling Stones when I was a kid was that on my little hometown radio stations, all they played was like old country, and I really didn't like it. And suddenly, um, uh, Beggar's Banquet, um, Let It Bleed, those those records they brought the thing that I didn't love, but that I knew so well, and it was part of my fiber and made it rock. And mm -hmm. so I look at music and I go, okay, well, I, well, I can't even recognize country now because country in the new country sounds like 80s yeah, pop. Yeah. And, yeah. And, yeah. And, and pop music sounds like top line and groove. It's just like, so at a certain point, genres seem kind of ridiculous. Um, it just winds up being music. Um, but, you know, I've always gravitated to the country feel with the rock feel with the Memphis feel. And it just winds up being music, you know, all the categories of the Grammys, you know, um, I, I did a couple of years ago. Um, I made the Threads record and I love that record so much. And it was an authentic for me, an authentic experience to collaborate and of course, it didn't get nominated for a Grammy, which was totally fine, because for me, the award and the joy and the reward of it was getting to work with my heroes. But I remember um, I remember somebody saying to me, you know, it should have been nominated for a Grammy. And I was like, you know what? Instead, they need to, as well as best new artists, they need to give an award for best old artist. <laughs> um, you know, just like... <laughs> Your middle ground, me, Nick, like Nick Mason. Robert Plant, yeah, Nick, you know, they're still out there writing music. <laughs> when we started this band, Nick said his dream was to simultaneously win a lifetime achievement and best newcomer. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Let's talk about Threads because it is such a stellar. St I mean, there must it must have been. This is everyone you, you know. You talk about growing up listening to 
and everyone is on your record. It's kind of an interesting thing because um, as a school teacher in St. Louis, I went and saw Hail Hell Rock and Roll. They were filming it in St. Louis and there's Steve Jordan and Keith Richards and of course Chuck Berry and I was just a school teacher. And then cut to 30 years later, I'm in the studio with Keith and Steve Jordan is producing and you can't, you can't envision those things. You can't like as a 20 year old go, okay, in 30 years, I'm going to be in the studio with those guys that I'm watching right now. Um, yeah, but would, and James Taylor myself. and Stevie so, Nicks and. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, and to not, you know, to have loved and idolized them, but then to get to work with them, working with Stevie in the studio. And to me, the threads record was, was the result of my working with Chris Christopherson, who was starting to lose oh. the ability to make memories. And I realized, gosh, these are my heroes. And, we're in the phase now. Yeah, one of my where we're all getting old. One of my favorite duets ever. If you, I don't know whether you've seen it. It's where he, sing, oh, he sings. Yeah, he, we, he sings with Rita Coolidge on Old Grey Whistle Test. We watched. It's on the Old Grey Whistle Test. We watched this over and over on the bus. It's one of the most intimate kind of uh, uh, just re- and sort of erotically charged, if you like, duets ever. It's amazing. Yeah, he's brilliant. Yeah, if you can find it. Well, you know, he's a sexy dude. You know what, I, what uh, there's a bit in the in the film where you're on stage at a festival in America and, and you see the audience of young kids singing uh, one of your early songs. I can't remember which one. If it makes you happy, maybe. I, I can't remember which one it was. Oh, if it makes you happy. And, yeah. and what occurred to me is, because there was also this conversation you were having about worrying about relating to younger people as we get older. And it occurred to me that what actually happens is you make these records and that younger you will sing to younger people forever. And as you get older, you, that 30 year old uh-huh. you will sing to 30 year olds forever. And, and, and that's, that, it's, you're, that will always be relevant. But right now, I guess, you are writing more for people that have lived lives. Do you feel that? I am, but I mean, I love that idea because, you know, um, you don't feel like your age. I remember my grandmother telling me that she, she when, when she got old, she would wash dishes and she'd look down and go, oh my gosh, whose hands are those? Because you don't, mm. you don't feel like uh, the person with the wrinkly <laughs> hands, you know, and unless you look in the mirror, you don't feel like um, the age that you are. I know you guys can relate to that. We feel useful and we feel yeah. in, still yeah. inspired and still I mean, I still practice. I still, and I still get off. Oh, on steady, you. steady. I know. Well, you know, the pandemic was amazing because my kids would be like, oh, Mom, yeah, why, why are you playing the guitar? And I'd be like, because I like it. I, li- I enjoy it. You know, it's not something that you have the luxury of doing when you're always out on the road or whatever. But, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, you know, I, um, I find myself now, I do write from the standpoint of who I am now. But even the song Forever, which I wrote about my my kid and what he's experiencing and the stress and the anxiety of being alive now, that we do have to remember that every single moment is, a, you know, it's a it's a precious gift. And that, I mean, as woo woo and as greeting card as it sounds, we have to remember that every moment we spend like this is a moment we can't get back and mm. um, that that's all that matters. And you know, will that relate to a 13 year old? Maybe not right now, but will it matter when he's 25? Maybe, you know, it's, you just don't, you never know. Yeah, I mean, looking at the phone nonstop and not, you know, when I was, when I was 11, I got given a guitar and I just- We're as bad, we're as bad. <laughs> all my time writing on it, you know, that's what I did, you know. It was, yeah. In fact, right now I yeah. want to reach over you and pull that J200 off the wall I can see <laughs> in your fabulous <laughs> studio. <laughs> I, what okay. a studio. Yeah. Amy Lou Harris gave me that guitar. I just, I'm just, i just gonna say it, Amy Lou Harris oh. gave me that guitar. Yeah. Uh-oh. That's not helping, that's not I'm helping. Sorry. <laughs> I'm very sorry. That's beautiful. I just, I'm just, <laughs> Take a moment, breathe it in. <laughs> I know, because so, you have a fabulous collection of vintage amps and yeah, guitars and stuff, don't yeah. you? A lot of tellies. Yeah, I, I will tell I've you that. I've got great I, envy I'm, looking at your studio. Underneath all the hair and the fake eyelashes is a total music nerd and gear geek. Uh, Cheryl, we've, 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 <laughs> we've kept you for an hour, and I know that you're on a really tight regime and you're, you're talking to lots of people promoting this film. I just want to say that I, I think this is one of the great 
rock documentaries. We absolutely loved it. Yeah. And uh, anyone who gets a chance to see it should go out and see it and buy the record as well because you've done some new tracks for the record, for the soundtrack, haven't you? Yes, yeah. In fact, we recut, or well, not recut, we cut Live With Me, which was the first thing I got to sing with the Rolling Stones. And Mick played on it. I texted him and said, hey, we're cutting Live With Me for the documentary. And would you play some harp on it? He's like, yeah, send it over. And I mean, that's the kind of thing like I went, ah! <laughs> you know, you're still that 14 year old girl who's yeah. Yeah, zipping, yeah, yeah. And zipping sticky fingers, you know, and yeah, absolutely. Anyway, good luck. crazy. Good luck with everything. Nice. Thank you so much for doing our show. Thank you. And it's yeah, great it's to so, see you It's guys. so nice to see you, Cheryl. Really it's nice to see you. It's lovely to have that tiny dearly. little... I love you. And it's so nice to be a tiny, tiny little nugget right back in, at some point in your story. Uh, well, <laughs> you definitely are. You definitely are. You've inspired me. I mean, your bass playing is ridiculous. Oh, good luck with the tour because yeah. the tour is about there, to start. The tour is about to start, right? Yeah, we're we're finishing the summer tour, and then I'm getting ready to work on a one woman show. But hopefully, we're going to be. Oh, um, I know. Is that going to be storytelling? Gonna... Is, is that going to be storytelling yeah. and that sort of thing? Yeah, story I've done telling. that. I've done that. If you want, if you want any help with that, I've done that. Hey, no, look, guy, years. guy, Bruce Springsteen done it. <laughs> Bruce Springsteen will give her help. <laughs> Right? It's tricky oh, when you say uh, it's tricky when you say one woman show plus a guy, <laughs> a plus oh, yeah. guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm not. I'm not saying I want to be in it. I'm just saying if you want any tips. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I will be calling you. <laughs> Thank you oh, so, so much. much. Thank you so much for talking to us. Thanks, guys. I am grinning like a Cheshire cat here. Yeah, she's lovely, isn't she? I mean, I'm just totally in awe of her talent. I mean, her chops in the in the in the film, in the documentary. Of, you know, going from one instrument to the next, bass, guitar, and 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 whirly and piano. I mean, and keyboards. The the keyboard playing, is, which is something we haven't really seen before. Her keyboard playing is fantastic. Well, she was a music teacher. That's how she she. That was her I first know. job coming out of school. What I like about Cheryl is there's nothing. She's still in, so enthusiastic and so in love with the business, and you really got that sense from her. Yeah. She's not battered yeah. by it to the extent that she's, you know, cynical now, um, like we are. And, and <laughs> could be, as, as it was interesting, you know, pointing that that journey. You could be, you could be a real hard, hardened <clears throat> artist. After yeah, that. yeah. She's, you know, um, wow. Well, as Keith says, she's very strong. You know. Yeah, because Keith's in the video talking about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in the film. Uh, I, I'm so glad we made it through the traffic, through over the motorways. Our, our yeah. coach had an accident. And let's just say, we did, we left, we actually left Geneva early, especially, just so we could get Yeah, yeah but don't you remember that? Uh, uh, so we need to thank the band. We need to thank the rest of the band for doing that for us. But our coach got, it was caught in an accident right at the beginning. And we st we had a policeman come along and, and, and the driver's having to get... We had a policeman and oh. everything. And then we had a truck pull across us and hit us and we had to stop and luckily that was de-escalated. Oh, oh, all sorts. All things we go through for Oh, you. dear listener, if you only knew what we go through to bring you <laughs> your uh, weekly uh, anyway, we're still, morsel. We've still got two more in the diary before we uh, finish the tour, haven't we? I think so. Uh, we have, yeah. Rock and Tours continues. Um, thank you so much to, to Ben and to Stu and to Ian and all who produced this uh, show and, uh, and, and we will be back Next week. We will. So it's good night from me. And it's good night from us. Bye.